Hello and welcome to Building Progressive Web Apps with Ionic and Spring Boot. My name is Matt Rabel. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana. No electricity, no running water for 16 years. I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. And yes, it was uphill both ways. Very unique childhood. I didn't even realize that my friends had TVs or anything until I went to school. So I was pretty happy until I became a, you know, a school age kid. And then I was like, why does everyone else have electricity and toilets and stuff? Um, we used to have a trick when I was a kid where you'd wait for someone to go out to the outhouse so they'd warm up the seat in the winter, and uh, then it would be warm when you went. I have an expensive obsession with Volkswagen buses and Vanagons. Um, if you have a similar problem, I'd love to talk to you about it. <laughs> I work for StormPath. We do users in the cloud. You could say we do users as a software service, but the abbreviation for that is UAS. That's not very nice, so I like to say user management as a software service. We basically offer a faster speed to market, um, complete identity solution out of the box. If you're using Spring Boot, it's just a few lines of code. If you're using you know, another framework like Python um, with Flask, um, we do the same thing there. Um, security best practice updates by default, clean and elegant API, and little to no code, so very little maintenance. Spring Boot automatically configures Spring whenever possible. How many people are using Spring Boot? Okay, so that's about half the people in the room. How many people want to use Spring Boot? How many people can't use Spring Boot? Because you're on WebSphere? Android. Android. Well, it doesn't really work on Android, right? Um, the Ionic stuff will, though, and, and you know, using Spring Boot on the back end is certainly you know, a good possibility. So the reason I like it and the reason I really got into it in 2013, so now that it's been you know, um, over three years ago was because it just had externalized configuration. The ability to you know, have properties files or environment variables and it would just pick those up and use them. That became a very useful feature for the project I was working on. And the health checks and the metrics, you know, the ability to monitor the application was very nice. Um, the fact that it was no code generation, right? It was just um, plain Java and Java config from Spring was really nice. And the fact that it embed Tomcat, Jetty, and Undertow kind of became a revolution, right? We didn't know that was possible three years ago, and now everyone's doing it. And there's really, you know, the old way of doing it where you deploy wars to a container is kind of out of date. So getting started with, with Spring Boot is pretty easy. You just use Spring Initializer. Start.spring.io basically has a web interface or a command line interface. So since starting these things are going to take a while, I'm going to do those as we're going through the presentation. Now you probably can't see my screen, so we'll go back here and we'll mirror it. Try to mirror it. Oh, I gotta like get my mouse over here. This is the hardest part of the presentation. Where is the mouse? Is it on that side? There we go. Then we go over here. Okay. So I have a shortcut to basically start with StormPath and Spring Boot. You can see it there. Basically hit start.spring.io, um, hits the starter.zip, so that gives me a downloaded zip, and then I'm specifying the dependencies of data JPA, data rest, um, H2 for an embedded you know, database, web for Spring MVC, dev tools, which will allow me to recompile and restart everything, security, that's Spring security, and then StormPath, which builds on top of Spring security. You'll also see here there's this line, if you want to get really fancy, you can actually download everything and run it right from the get-go. And so I won't do that one, I'll just do this demo one. So I'm going to start by creating a directory, call it jfocus, and then I'll do the start storm path. And so that downloaded a zip file for me. If I unzip that, and we'll take it into a server directory. And then if I cd into server, I can do NVM Spring Boot run. And so what this gives you out of the box is you know, protected resources and everything's protected. So if you were using Spring Security, what would happen was there would be a, a, a message printed in the console that says, hey, your user password is this, and it's randomly generated every time. But since you're using StormPath on top of Spring Security, it doesn't do that, and what you'll have to do if you want to use StormPath, was you go to api.stormpath.com, and then instead of logging in, you would you know sign up for a new account. And so once you sign up, that's all it takes, and then you get 10,000 requests a month. And uh, you know me as a developer using StormPath all the time, I barely hit that. So 
it's pretty much free and, uh, and secret. Um, we don't really knock you if you go over yet. So get in now. Um, but then you download an API key. So I have an API key in, in my correct directory and a .storm path directory in my home directory. And so if I go to this local host 8080, what happens is you get login password, you get basically forgot password functionality, and you get all this, which is embedded in a Spring Boot starter. So that's the real power of Spring Boot, is the fact that you can have these starters and provide all this functionality just from a jar file. Um, there's also the ability to resend a verification email, or you could go ahead and register. I already have a user account set up, so I'll just use that. And you basically logs in, and then you know there's a logout button. So that's the functionality there. And then we'll go back to the presentation, and then I'll create some services that we actually consume from Spring Boot. So Ionic is basically a open source framework for creating mobile apps. It's not really intended for desktop apps, but you can use it for desktop apps. And when I say desktop apps, I mean an actual browser-based, you know, on your desktop. Because there is a different type of desktop app, and that's a real desktop app. Um, and you can actually produce those with Electron. So Electron is a framework that Adam uses um, from GitHub, you know, for their editor, where you can actually have a desktop app um, that runs, you know, on your desktop and not in a browser. And so I actually have a branch on the uh, project that I'm going to show you today that does use Electron. If we don't get to that, um, I can, you know, tell you, you basically check it out and run it. And, uh, and you can see it's just a, basically a version of Chrome without any, you know, anything. It's just a Chromeless window. And so Ionic basically uses um, Cordova, which used to be called, or the, the commercial version is PhoneGap, and it bridges um, between the native APIs and what you're writing in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So as far as Angular is concerned, use Angular to write Ionic apps. If you're using Ionic 1, use Angular 1. If you're using Ionic 2, use Angular 2. And there's really no difference from writing a normal Angular app. Once you've generated the app and have everything up and running, you know, you're still writing components, you're writing services just like you would in a normal Angular app. When you deploy it to the phone, which we'll try to get to, it actually looks like a native app and functions like a native app. And if you deployed to Android, it would look like an Android app as well. So pretty powerful in the sense that you can use the web technologies that you know to create these mobile applications. So let me go ahead and create that app as well. So we'll stop this one. And we're going to call it Ionic Start. And then you give it a name. And what I'm going to create today is a really fun useless service. So the service is going to provide us a list of beers. And from that list of beers, it's going to filter out the bad ones. Now, I don't know about the ones that you call bad here, but I think the ones that we call bad in the US are universal, like Budweiser and Bud Light. And uh, you know, no one likes those. And so we're going to filter those out, create a good beer service. And then we're going to create an app that talks to that service and serves up that list you know, on a mobile device. But at the same time, it goes and talks to Giphy to get an image from them, an animated GIF usually, that represents the name of that beer. And so it's fun that if you want to give me names, you know, we can add those in and see what the associated GIF for it is. So I'm going to call it Ionic Beer. And then you have to pass in B2. This is the most important thing if you're creating you know, Angular 2 and above apps or using Ionic 2. If you don't pass in that V2 flag, then you get version 1, and uh, you know, you're in Angular 1 land. So I can do that. And it'll create it you know, in this directory. But that's going to take about a minute to complete, so I'll go back to the presentation. So Angular, you'll notice they say one framework. And I think you know, this is where it really starts to shine, is when you use things like Ionic or Electron and actually have apps that don't just get deployed in the browser, but they get deployed on the phone, or they get deployed with Electron as you know, a desktop app. It's pretty powerful, and it's nice that they allow us to do that. So, there's a big difference between doing responsive web design and mobile first web design. And a lot of us, I think, do responsive web design where we use our fast laptops, we use our fast phones, and we get it all working and then we say, oh, I gotta scale it down to work on a phone, right? And so that's a responsive way. And the better way to do is mobile first where you actually test on the device first. And there is the device toolbar in Chrome that allows you to actually you know, look at how your web page looks on a phone, so that's one strategy to use. Um, the other one is just to get a really slow laptop or a really slow phone. 
Um, so if you work for a company that you know believes in user experience, then that's you know something that they should sponsor you buying, right? You got your nice laptop, but then you have your slow one, or you have your slow Android phone that most of the world uses. And this, a lot of this comes from Alex Russell in this YouTube talk, and I just grabbed this quote out of that, basically saying that we failed on mobile. And the reason we failed on mobile is because we have these apps that take, on average, 19 seconds to load on a mobile device. Not apps, but web pages, right? Mobile websites. And people have kind of optimized for them, but not really, um, because they're still like multi-megabyte downloads. And so if you want to you know, see the real experience, what he recommends is, first of all, implementing the purple pattern, which I'll talk about, and then getting a really cheap Android phone, because this is what most people in the world are using, is these $200 you know, unlocked Android phones like a Moto G4, and basically having that experience that most people have. Same thing with DevTools and CPU throttling in Chrome. You can do that, so you can tweak it down to like a G3 connection, so it's you know, full, slow in what people experience. Um, but I don't know if everyone like is developing consumer apps, right? Me, myself, a lot of times I'm developing enterprise apps where everyone has a fast desktop, has a fast phone, and that's what you're developing for. But if you're Google, you can see why they basically recommend that you, know, you try to make it for the masses, for everyone in India and in Africa with the slower phones. And, uh, and so using Chrome Inspect is one way to basically see what's wrong with your application. Lighthouse is something that you can use to verify that you have a progressive web app. And the biggest feature of progressive web apps is they can run offline, right? You can open it up in your browser, and instead of you know, your browser refreshing and it's saying can't find the site, it actually works within you know, a browser. So the purple pattern is push, render, pre-cache, and lazy load. So push critical resources for the initial URL route. You can do that with a service worker and you can you know, cache things locally. You can also do it with HTTP2. And uh, if you have the ability to deploy an HTTP2, I highly recommend it. You can render that initial route, and then you pre-cache the remaining routes, and then lazy load everything else. So this is one of the biggest trends that's happening in web development today, in the sense of you know Google's really promoting progressive web apps as a way for you to build web apps that can be installed on an Android phone. The only problem is it doesn't really get much support from Apple, because they have an iOS SDK, right? Use iOS. Don't do these progressive web apps and you know, build it on your phone, which is funny because when the iPhone came out in 2006, that's exactly how they recommended to do it for the first year. Right? They just didn't have the progressive web apps technology. So to be a progressive web app, you must originate from a secure location. That's number one. If you're not on HTTPS, then you get a big like ding of 25% on your points in Lighthouse. Um, load while offline. So there is an offline trigger in Chrome in the developer tools, so you can use that to make sure it works offline. And then you have a web app manifest. And what that web app manifest says is basically, here's the name of the app, here's some icons, here's what it looks like when you install it as an app. So I'll show you briefly towards the end how we would do a progressive web app with Ionic. And then I'll show you how to use the Stormpath SDK for Angular. And now let's get to the live coding. We'll create a beer API, we'll create that UI with Ionic, we'll add Stormpath, and we'll hopefully deploy to iOS. We got 35 minutes, let's get to it. So here's the uh, Ionic beer, and I'm gonna move that to just call it client. So now in this directory we just have client server, we can remove that demo.zip, close this presentation, make it a little cleaner. You guys can see everything. If you have any questions during the talk, I encourage you to ask them then because maybe you missed something or maybe I went too fast and you want me to go back. And I have t-shirts for good questions. The word sizes, though, there's like an XL, an L, and a medium. So, you know, if you're not in that size, then you can still ask a question. I'll give you like a sticker instead. <laughs> so let's create this server. We'll open it up in IntelliJ. You'll see this is a shortcut that I have that I recommend here. If you use IntelliJ, alias idea, and you can basically open like that, and it'll open the project right in IntelliJ. It makes it you know, pretty easy and nice to use. How many people like IntelliJ? And I like you. <laughs> Any other fans? Shout it out. Who likes Emacs? I knew. I knew there was a few. Okay, so I got my handy dandy script here in case I forget stuff. 
Um, hopefully I won't need it too much. So I'm going to create a new package here. We'll just call it beer. Now I'll create an entity in there. Call it beer. And I got a few shortcuts here. So I can do stuff like boot, entity. And then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, I mean, if we could all code that fast, wouldn't it be nice? I encourage you to, to record similar templates if you're doing demos and stuff. These are live templates from IntelliJ, so I pre-recorded them. And this actual whole script that I'm doing today, there is a GitHub repo that I'll point you to at the end. So you could, you could do the whole tutorial if you wanted. Um, there's also a set of demo instructions that has the live templates if you actually want to do this for your company or at another conference. And so if you want those, just email me. I'll send you my IntelliJ live templates and you could type all this stuff in. But basically it's just an ID and a name for a beer. That's our entity that we're going to persist to our database. And then we're going to have a beer repository, which I almost called it my belly, but I'm just going to call it a beer repository. Oh, boot. There we go. So pretty simple. Just extends JPA repository and takes in a beer. Um, we got to give it a package here. Okay, and then import that guy. Why isn't it like it back here? It's public. Oh, it's not. There we go. Now you're going to import it. Come on. You're in the same package. All right, we'll go to the next one. What's that? It's in the right package, right? Oh, see, this is why I like to do pair programming. Thank you. Now we're good to go. Now we're good to go there. All right. So now that gives us enough to actually persist and do CRUD on a beer entity, right? Um, and now we'll do a command object to populate our database. So we'll call this beer command line runner. So this takes in that beer repository. Oh, I gotta get a package again. Never had so much fun with packages. Okay, and you'll notice this uses um, what Jurgen talked about this morning with Spring 4.3 and constructor injection. You don't have to use an auto-wired annotation anymore, it just works. Um, so this shows that here, that it's injecting that automatically. And then it's just gonna print out all the beers that it finds. Um, but we gotta enter some in there first. So I got these top five beers from beeradvocate.com. And you'll notice um, there's some funny names in there. Good Morning is number one, like of you know, rated beers. Um, Kentucky Brunch Brand Stout, Man Bear Pig, which is from South Park, if you've watched South Park. King Julius, very hazy, and then um, I put in some ones that I'm gonna filter out, right? The Budweiser, the Coors Light, and the PBR, or Paps Blue Ribbon. And then I'm gonna create a new one called Beer Controller for my REST API. Okay, and so that looks very similar. It just serves up, you know, that list as the root endpoint. So um, we're not going to do that one right now. We're going to add, I'm just going to delete this one, but you see how it works. Then we'll add a good beers endpoint, which basically takes all those beers and then filters them out and sees if they're great. And the is great basically says, hey, if it's Budweiser, or Coors Light, or PBR, it's not great. So take that out. And then rather than having Spring Boots, you know, JSON where, you know, has the JPA stuff about embedded and links and all that, um, it just grabs the ID and name and shoves that out so our UI can, can view it that way. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is on this repository, I'm going to add a repository REST annotation, REST resource. And what this does is it actually takes that repository and makes an anemic domain model. If you read ThoughtWorks um, Radar in November, they recommend against this, but we're just talking about beers. Um, and what they recommend against is just taking your domain model that you have in a database and just exposing it. 
right? You usually want to do some more customization. So that's what our Good Beers endpoint does. Um, but what this does is it also makes another endpoint available just called Beers, right? And so we can basically put new beers into there. We can, you know, pull them out. We can delete them. We can do all the, the rest stuff. So now we can start this up. And now we should be able to do, I use HTTP IE. Um, instead of curl, it's just got a little nicer interface. We can go localhost, 8080, good beers. And that basically gets denied because we aren't logged in, right? Everything's protected by Spring Security and StormPath. So I can use basic authentication. And my password, look away. <laughs> right, you can tweet it. You gotta have my API key though. I'm not gonna give you one of those. But there you can see it, it printed everything out, right? So we got our server running, we'll keep that running. And now we'll go on to the application. So in here, what you use to start up an Ionic application is you do Ionic serve. That's, you know, if you've ever used Angular or Angular CLI, you use ng serve. So they've kind of replicated that with Ionic. And it'll start up here on uh, port 8100. And it'll have live reloadability. So if you actually, you know, change the app or anything, um, then it works. So this is great. It's already got login and password in there. You know why that happens? because progressive web apps are a pain in that they get stuck in your browser. So I've developed this before, and it's got service workers, it caches everything, it'll work offline, um, but because I didn't actually clear my cache in my browser, it thinks it's still there. So I have to go into this application, this clear storage, and hit clear site data, and then it actually takes it out and runs a real app. So um, you should know that um, if you're doing similar demos. So this is the default. Ionic app that you get if you don't specify anything. It's got home, it's got about, and it's got contact, right? Not a whole lot in there. The cool thing is if you do Ionic serve dash L, it opens it up in what's called Ionic Labs. And it's a different view of this and shows what it would look like on an Android device, on an iPhone, and on Windows Phone. So you can see here, they also tell you you should really install an app and do it that way because it's more real world, which I believe. Um, but these platforms here, you can do Android, Windows, and then i got to make my browser bigger, I think, if we want to see Windows. So there you go. The difference is, you know, tabs are on the bottom by default on iPhone and Android, and on Windows, they're on the top. You can change that. There's an easy setting to say, I always want them on the bottom on all devices, or I always want them on the bottom, you know, on just this one. So, again, works just like before. And that's your basic Ionic app to get started. To see... The iPhone view, this is the toolbar you use in Chrome, this toggle device toolbar. And then up here you can change it to, if you want it to be like an iPhone 6, and you want it to be 100%, you can see you know, all the different settings there. So a very handy way of seeing what your app looks like, kind of, on a phone. So we'll make that up 100%. And then what I'm going to do is I can't talk to that beer service unless I actually authenticate against it. Um, so. When I started writing this actual application to show how to do this, it was interesting because what I had to do is I actually had to, we don't want this guy open, um, I had to go in and, and we have components, right, that I've created for our Angular 2 SDK. We have a login component, like a forgot password component, a register component, and to override those templates um, to look and use Ionic templates, I basically had to subclass my existing components. And so what happens when you do that is you run into this issue where Ionic uses Angular 221. So Ionic only supports Angular 221. If you want to override or subclass components to override templates, you have to use Angular 23. So what my hope is that they will upgrade soon before my app goes to production. So I upgrade to 2.3 because I like that convenience of being able to override components. What happens is you won't get a compile error if you subclass a component and override its template. It'll work, or you think it'll work, but then when you actually have your template calling methods of that parent component, it won't find it. So you'll end up getting errors like in your browser about not being able to find you know, that method. Um, and what, it, what they said about this was that they would probably just target Angular 2.4 or Angular 4, which comes out in March, or is scheduled for March, 
and then you know their compiler would work. So Angular has an NGC compiler that does the tree shaking and ahead of time compiling and all that. They've basically created their own on top of Angular's and haven't had time to upgrade it to 2.3. So after upgrading, you do have to you know reinstall. I like to use Yarn instead of npm because it's kind of like Maven. It caches everything and uh, it's in you know memory and usually happens pretty fast. So it's upgrading me to Angular 2.3 and then I'm going to add Stormpath. So Angular Stormpath. If you're developing a, just a regular um, Angular application, this is what you would use to install it. Um, but since I'm doing Ionic, I created a separate project that just has Ionic templates in it. And you'll see there it pulls in Ionic, pulls in Angular Stormpath, and then we allow you to use cookies or local storage for storing access tokens. What it does is an OAuth workflow, so it's going to hit OAuth um, token as an endpoint, and then it's going to get an access token and a refresh token back. They'll be in the form of JWTs or JOTs, and it'll have all the information. It'll be signed. You don't really need to interact with them, but when you have endpoints that you need to talk to, you need to pass that token as an authorization header to the endpoint, and that's standard OAuth practices. So now that we've installed the pages, we have to configure Stormpath for that endpoint. So if we go into app module, basically if you have your app in the same war or jar as your Spring Boot app, you don't have to configure it, it just expects it to be by default in that app. But if you're going to use um, it on a different endpoint, or like we're doing, we're running one on one port and one on another port, then you do have to set up cross-origin resource sharing or cores to allow that Spring Boot server to you know, recognize this server. So first of all, I have to import Stormpath configuration from Angular Stormpath. And then I'm pointing to 8080, right? That's my server, that's gonna be my endpoint prefix. And then the server, which we still have running, I think. The only way that we've integrated Stormpath here is just by specifying our default boot starter. And so again, it's the beauty of Spring Boot and that they give these hooks in there where we can configure things for you without you having to write any code for it. Um, but there is one thing we do have to do and that is that cross-origin resource sharing. So we have to set it up where we have Stormpath, Web, cores, allowed, origin, URIs. You see that? All I did was start typing storm and that came up. So this is another feature that Spring Boot adds is if you have properties that are specific for your application or your plugin, you can define what they are and then it'll give you code completion and IDs. So here we can do localhost 8100. And I discovered a bug that basically there's an origin header sent when it's deployed on a device um, of file colon slash slash. And according to the good folks at Ionic and Stack Overflow this morning, um, it's actually said to be a bug in Tomcat or Undertow or Jetty. Um, but this, in the particular sense, was Tomcat. So you shouldn't have to specify this file colon slash slash if you're using like a most recent version of Tomcat with Spring Boot. Um, but what I found is you do have to add this. So that's how we're gonna configure our server to allow requests from the client. And then we have our client back here, and we'll, we stopped it there, so we'll run it from here. Um, I do have to configure a couple more things. One is Stormpath module. I need to import that, and the Ionic module. So the Stormpath module has a Stormpath service. So if you didn't want to use like our pre-built pages, you could actually you know, just use the service, and it's got like login, you know, you pass a username and password in. Um, that all works pretty nicely. And then basically you need to have entry points. And so these are login page, register page, and forgot password page. And you'll see these are imports from Ionic. And if we were to control click on them, well you can't see their templates, but you can you know, kind of see what it looks like. So it's got, it extends from login component, this is from Angular Stormpath, and then it's got forgot register and ion view did load. Um, and there's a constructor that does construction injection for everything. So now if we run this guy,
it's not going to quite work yet because what we need to do is there's an app component and right here what it does is once the app is ready it basically shows the tabs page right and so we need to add some logic in here that basically says do more than that and so I do this up here I grab this platform thing and put it in the constructor and import the login page. Uh oh, you hear that? Fans going now. It's like locked up and everything. Oh, there we go. It happens every once in a while when you have Spring Boot and Ionic running. So um, the reason that it's complaining there is we already set this to a tabs page. And so one of the things you can do is just add the type of any in TypeScript, and then it'll resolve that. So this is our main StormPass service that calls into the user. And this is an observable, so you can subscribe to it and say, hey, if there's a user, it returns basically false or a Boolean or an account. So if there's an account, um, then you know go to the tabs page. But if there isn't, go to the login page. And so back here, we got an error about the me endpoint. That's going to 8100 me, right? It's not going to localhost um, 8080. And the reason for that is because I forgot one configuration setting in here, and that is to set that StormPath configuration as a provider. So we're going to override the default StormPath configuration, and we're going to do use factory and point to that method, which was StormPath config, right? This is defined right up here. We export as StormPath config. You can actually do this and not have it in there like that, but it won't pass the ahead of time compiling that, that Angular does. So if you have you know things like this, um, they recommend you put it in functions and then export them, and then you can talk to it down here. So provider, there we go. Now you get to wait for Webpack to update it. I mean, the cool thing about Angular, right, with Angular 2 is there's compiling again. So there's more breaks, there's more coffee, there's more time to talk with your colleagues. Um, so it's build finished. And now back here, you'll see that we actually get you know, a login page now. Um, there's also forgot password. And the cool thing about Ionic is it does all these navigation stuff for you. So um, these little things up top, I didn't have to create those, right? It creates those for me in the back navigation. Um, the forgot password, it's you know, right up there as well. Um, this create account, it actually fetches this data, it's JSON data, from um, the endpoint that we hit in our browser. So um, we can actually go back here and go HTTP localhost 8080, login, and then we'll have to, I don't think we need to authenticate against that one. It gives JSON data back. So this is a way that StormPath basically builds the forms for you. Um, you can see here that um, these Ionic templates don't support social login right now, but it does have that information in here that says, hey, there's a, a Facebook you know, login configured for this account. So it's very easy to add social providers and stuff like that. So I'm going to use just you know, my regular password here. And now I can log in and see everything else like before. Um, the problem is you really don't have proof that you're logged in, so let's add that proof. Um, we'll go into this, um, I believe it's home. HTML, and I'm going to add a logout button, right? Because you want to be able to log out. You might not want to be in there all the time. And so the reason I did this is I want to show you what happens when you do it wrong. See that? It's not in the nav bar. It's kind of outside of there. So this is the IO header. This is the ion nav bar. And then the buttons are outside of there. So you want to put them inside, and then it looks better. As, as IntelliJ locks up. So if you put it inside, then now we have a logout button here, right? So um, it says self-context logout is not a function, and that's because we need to add it. Actually, this home, we need to add it in home.ts because it's calling that right there, right? So in home.ts, we'll add I O home. 
we'll add two things. We'll add a constructor that takes in storm path because we need that to actually do the log out. And then there's an observable here. There's, again, I got to type in the import from Angular storm path. That resolves that. And then we set the user to user and we import the account as well. And what this will allow us to do is actually display like the user's name, right? And it'll also allow us to log out. So back in home, we could add something down here, like IO username. And it basically says, hey, if they're logged in, then show their name. And it uses async because that's an observable and it needs to, you know, resolve that. So now you can see we're logged in as hip user, that happens to be my name, and this logout button actually works. So now we're getting somewhere, we can finally start developing our beer service. And we got like 10, 15 minutes left. So one of the things that the, um, that this does when you actually click on login is you see it sets that focus right there on the email field. And that's easy enough to do with Ionic. Um, but if you want the phone to do that, you actually have to configure it to allow that. So in here, there's all these preferences. And keyboard display requires user action is one of those that you want to set to false. So it can actually pop up the keyboard as soon as it hits that login screen. Um, if you don't do that, it just basically won't set the focus on that email when you first log in. And so I like to put this into git, or git init, git add. First commit. Okay, so now we have everything in there, and our service is already working, so we just need a good beers UI. So you can use Ionic to generate, Ionic generate page beer. Oh, we're not in the right directory, so you have to be in the Ionic project. And so once you do that, it generates it under this pages directory, right? There's an HTML file it generates, there's an SCSS file, so it does, you know, SAS by default, and then it has, you know, an actual beer component, or what they call a page. And so the first thing you're going to want to do, it doesn't do this for you, I think they will add it, um, but, uh, but this is something like Angular CLI does now, is it will add it right here, right, as an entry point. Um, you also have to add it as a declaration because it's in this project. So now we have those, so we should be able to get to the beer page, but um, we're not going to be able to see it unless we have tabs for it, right? So we'll go in here, we'll make this one three, we'll make this one four. Call it beer, and as luck should have it, there is a tab icon for beer. Um, Ionic ships with a number of icons, so if you search for Ionic two icons, they call them Ionicons, and basically they're different for different devices, right? It renders differently on different devices. Maybe it doesn't render on all devices, right? Angular is only going to work on iOS, um, but you can basically, you know, search, and lo and behold, there's one for beer. So you can easily add it in there like that. Um, and now you also need to add it in the tabs file here. So we'll say here that we have two, three, four. This one's going to be our beer page. So now if we log in, should be there. Oh, it's not running. Did you notice that it cached it in the browser and I didn't even tell it to? So Ionic does have uh, PWA capabilities that I'll get to in a minute, um, but basically it's it's pretty easy to do. If uh, if you have an index.html, which is in the source directory, service workers is the biggest thing that makes a progressive web app work. Besides the HTTPS and the you know HTTP2, in the sense that it allows you to cache requests to a network and load them up from that cache in your browser. So um, all the network requests you make, you can basically use this, uncomment it, and it uses serviceworker.js that is in this project, and then it basically you know, caches all your network requests. So this is what allows you to like work offline. Um, it also has this manifest, right, that I talked about that you need that web app manifest defined here that you know, gives the name of the app, and, uh, and once you turn your browser on to recognize PWAs, you'll get a 404 for this assets images logo because it doesn't exist, right? So even though they generate a path to it, it doesn't actually exist in that directory. So now back to our beer list, we wanna make that actually show 
some beers from our server. So the first thing is we're going to need a service to actually do it. So generate service, or provider, they call them. Oh, yeah, Myonic, generate. You guys are great. Good pair of programming. I almost want to give out t-shirts for pair of programming help. So what this does is down in providers here, it puts that beer service. Oh, can't do it in the comment. I must have named it something else. Oh, I'll go back to this guy. Right, and so it's got HTTP in there, so there's this ng2 get that you can use, um, and it'll do localhost. Come on, it's all frozen. HTTP, localhost 8080, and then we'll import that response. Come on, import it. Um, but we're not going to want to do this in the constructor, right? We're going to want to do it in a method. We'll call it good beers, um, get good beers method. And we'll just do it like that. But we want to point to the good beers. Right? And then in the module in the beginning, what we did is we configured it so the auto-authorized URIs are anything that's past localhost 8080. So what this does is adds a bearer token or an authentication token that's bearer token from the actual you know, access token that we got back when we logged in. And so that passes on that jot and makes it able so we're able to talk to there. Um, so we modify beer, HTML for the list. So this is just going to list those beers. Ion list and ion item are basically you know, UL and LI that you would normally do in HTML. And then in our beer.ts, is where we're going to call that service. So we'll delete this stuff. And we're going to set that beers as a local array. We'll import that beer service. And there's basically two ways to use the service. So we can set a provider right here. Providers is beer service. Um, but it's usually better to do it in your module. And then more than one component can use it. So I just do it there. And that makes it available for the beer service. So beers.ts, we basically take that beer service. When the ion view did load, we call it. We subscribe to it. We show them. All right, so now we're here. And we're getting those beers, right? They're coming back from the server. It's doing the authentication. If we were to look at you know, the network request, it's not going to go to the right tab. Um, but you can see, almost see, it's way down there. It's got that authorization, that bearer token, that jot that's been passed you know, to the server side. So now um, we need to have a Giphy right, service. So Ionic generate provider Giphy service. Now if we look at that guy. Oh, wrong one. So this guy, um, basically, I did it in the wrong spot. So we'll delete the whole thing. ng Giphy service. And this I got from this Pluralsight tutorial. Um, so this API key, who knows when it'll stop working. If you, uh, if you try this yourself, it could stop working any day. But it basically takes that search term from you know the actual beer and goes out to there and grabs those. And if it doesn't find one, then it portrays a dancing cat for a 404. So it's possible it won't actually find one. Um, back here we can do for each, or not for each. Or so let beer of beers, this gives you service, which you have to dependency inject. And it's, if you're used to doing Java, it's kind of backwards, because you know usually the type is first. 
So we put that guy there, and then in our module, we have to add it here as well. Now we'll change from using this so we get a little bigger. Oh, we haven't added it to our template, right? You gotta add it there. Beer.html in here. Um, I'm gonna do IO avatar. And so it just, you know, has an avatar in there, there's a component for it, and it's gonna display it. So you can see there, you know, there's some funny ones, but you can't quite see them. So Let's create a modal so we can actually see, you know, what it looks like and basically add new ones. So to do this in beer.html, first of all, I'm going to add a button, but we want that in the nav bar. That's not it. So this, you can see there, it opens a modal and it has a circle and a beer as icons. Now if we go back here, we can see it's up there, but it calls this open modal, which doesn't exist. Frozen. And you can use a modal controller. So this public modal controller is a ionic thing that you can use. Dependency. Then once you have that, um, we're going to create a beer modal page, right, and then present it. And then once you close those modals, you can actually listen to them as well. So the reason I close it is because when it's closed, we want that view to refresh again, right, and to be able to see that list again with the new thing in there. So in here, let me just create a beer modal TS and a beer modal.html. There's the HTML, and so this modal, same thing, right? Header toolbar, and then if there's a beer present, it shows the details, otherwise it shows add one. And then you can see here these buttons um, look a little different, right? On iOS or core, core meaning in your browser, I wanna see a cancel button. Um, otherwise, with Android or Windows, it shows a different icon. And then here is the form for you know saving a new beer, and this is how you do an input. So you could actually do input and then ion input, it doesn't matter. Um, but ion input's the default. And then here it's saying if there's a beer, then show the URL from it and then have, you know, save buttons. So this guy is, uh, is a beer modal page and it basically injects all those services, right? The beer service, the Giphy service, and nav control. But it also has beer service get, it gets it by ID and it saves it, but those methods don't exist yet. So in here we have to do add those, right, and then import the observables. And then you'll see here this talks to this beer API, so we'll set this beer API equals and that's provided by um, by the actual endpoint, that REST repository that we had, right? That puts, that as an endpoint that we can actually CRUD beers on. And then back, make sure that one's good. No, it hasn't been imported. Um, we have to import it in the module. So I think Ionic will eventually probably do this part for you, um, just because Angular CLI has started doing it when you actually generate components. Now you can click that. Oh, it's not defined. Thought we just defined it. Create it. This is where you refresh. Try again. See, and now it actually brings that up. But you probably want something more interesting. We want to see those actual images. So here we can do um, let's see, we add a click handler, right? 
and we point to the open modal, and we pass in id beer.id. This will be the last thing I do, because I want to show you what the images look like. The good morning one's fun. And then the last thing I was going to show you is how to swipe delete, right? It has the ability to do that pretty easily. I don't know why it's taking so long to build. It's like the demo gods. Also doesn't help that there's multiple tabs running. Now you can see, right? Good morning. Not bad. Um, so to show you, um, there is a Spring Boot Ionic example under the StormPath repository. This is in my slides, so I'll show it there as well. And uh, it basically has all this stuff in there. Um, this is just if you want to run it and see it running. Um, if you want to see the tutorial, um, you know, it's got a lot in there. If you try to print it, it's, uh, it's a good, you know, 18 pages long. So it um, has all the code in there that you can copy and paste and create the app, you know, yourself that way. So we did all that. There's a link to the code, the step-by-step -step tutorial. If you want to learn Ionic, I recommend this uh, Building Mobile Apps with Ionic 2. Um, it basically talks a lot about Angular. So if you know Angular, and when I say Angular, I don't mean AngularJS, right? I mean Angular 2, Angular 4, Angular 5, which will be out in the fall. Um, you pretty much know Ionic. Um, I built the app before I read this book, and then I read the book in like an hour, even though it's like 300 pages long, just because it was a lot about TypeScript, it was a lot about Angular, and so it's, it's pretty easy to learn once you know Angular. So a shortcut to becoming an Ionic expert, just do it. Like just start coding and you'll learn a lot more than just you know reading about it and tutorials and stuff like that. Like start writing the app. And I came up with a new way, because this is a Nike slogan, so I like to say just dev it. Come on, that's funny. That's it. Any questions? Free t-shirts for questions. So it's authentication, authorization, and custom data. So you can upload custom data. You can have up to 10 megabytes per user of custom data. And then that custom data is searchable as well. Um, but one of the things that I want to figure out is, OK, if you have an entity model with a user object in it, you know, how do you relate that to StormPath? And what our recommendation is right now is you have an href, right, which is a URL to that user in StormPath. But we probably need some sort of repository that will fetch that automatically for you. you know. So you can use basic authentication, you can use OAuth. Um, we are adding OpenID Connect. Right, so you configure them in groups within the UI. Okay, you do that. Yep, and then you can have them in different groups. And then you can use different directives with Angular to basically say this person can't see this. With Angular 2, you can use a guard um, that prevents them from going there. Yep, and I'm the main developer on the Angular SDK, so if you have any questions or problems, I can actually fix it right away. Yeah. Right, so, um, so as far as uh, what Ionic is concerned, um, I didn't show you the Electron version, um, but it does have a way of seeing those in an emulator, right, if you're under Android or iOS emulator. As far as the actual templates themselves, um, a lot of that's up to you, right? If you wanna have two columns instead of one, you wanna target like an iPad or something like that, then that's up to you to do, right? And they provide ways to do it, um, but it's not like it doesn't, you know, it scales responsibly, but um, a lot of that's up to you to write. Let's try it. Oh, you want me to show it? That one there? Okay. Take a picture. Or, you know, if you hit me up on Twitter, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, M. Rabel. I'll upload all these slides to SlideShare. They'll be on the JFocus site. I got some stickers up here. It's probably weird that I have DevOps US stickers, but I was on the committee to pick developers, so I know that's going to be a good one. Um, I have cards and uh, t-shirts. So those are three questions. Do you happen to wear like an extra large or a medium or a large? Medium? I think the rest of you are free to go unless you have other questions. 